go ahead and call the meeting to order. <clears throat> Regular board meeting on June 16th, uh, 7 p.m. Um, first, we're going to say the pledge. So if you join me, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor on the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to the of Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. <coughs> Uh, the first item on our list tonight is the consent agenda. Did any of the board members have any qu questions or changes that you needed to be made? No, sir. Nope. Nope. Motion. Have any oh. motions? Go ahead. Sorry. Motion to approve minutes as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Minutes are adopted. Um, we do have two comments to the board, um, and I'll go ahead and call you guys up um, in turn. The one thing I would say is that um, we, we ask that you keep them to five minutes um, each, and that, uh, you know, we, we can't say anything to you. So it's, if we're not responding to you, it's not that we agree with you or don't agree with you. It's just by law, we can't, we can't respond. So uh, the first that I'll call up is Miss um, Amy Jones. Good evening, again. Um, I, really, I saw that this was on the agenda, but I still would like to say my piece. On March 2nd, MISD released a letter from Dr. Rees that highlighted a, a three-level response to coronavirus. The third level of that plan was defined as being applied when there are reported local cases, which is clearly the current situation here in Montgomery. The steps to be taken included, amongst other steps, canceling all traveling events, is this plan and the steps to be taken still under the plan, are they still applicable? There are currently more COVID patients in Montgomery County than when school was canceled, and those numbers continue to rise. Does the school district have a comprehensive contingency plan in place for if and when we, we move to a remote learning as needed again? Hopefully not. Even during the stay-at-home order, it was seen or noted that many people, including teachers, administrators, students, and parents of students, did not heed the orders attending social events at private residences. With such a lack of social distancing displayed, what steps will MISD take to ensure we don't see outbreaks within the school population? Will students and staff be required to take COVID tests? Have, will temperatures be taken daily, et cetera, before school starts? How are we as parents supposed to feel safe sending our children back to school when the staff are not following the state recommended rules? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm sorry if I'm gonna say this name wrong. Aliyah Esparza? Thank you for your time. Um, I'm gonna build off of what um, Amy said in regards to your response in, for special education. Um, so I'm a parent of a child that falls under that blanket and when all of this hit in March, um, some of his pull out and his services, um, his needs were not met. And I know that it was because of this was unexpected, but what I wanna know is what is the district's plan? Should this happen again? What are you going to do for those students that do pull out sessions in school? Um, because PT, OT, um, speech therapy, all of that um, done virtually is, it's not beneficial to them. Um, it's very hard for them to get those services. Um, so I wanna know what the district has planned for that and also who will be in charge of that or a contact person so that we can make sure that our children do receive those services um, at the need that they need them. Thank you. Do we have any other comments? Okay. 
and as you mentioned, we, some of this should be addressed today. So, um, going on to our action items uh, tonight, uh, the first action item that we have is considering the approval of the 2020-21 Montgomery County Juvenile Justice Alternative Education Program, also known as JJAP Memorandum, Mem Memorandum of Understanding. I believe that's that's me. I bring this to you every year. It's a uh, Adopt in counties with more than 50,000 students, we have to, our population of 50,000, you have to offer a county JJAEP for serious offenses. Uh, this, we get this memorandum of understanding from Conroe, who is the physical house for the JJAEP, and in it, uh, it's the same document that we sign every year. It's just had the updated dates and, and uh, information. There's no, nothing different than what the states are. Are there questions about it? I, I guess one, one question, and we could talk about this later in the, when we talk about the, um, the COVID response and all that. Um, is there anything different about JJP as how they're gonna run it? No. Uh, is here related uh, to that? I'm not sure what they did during the remote learning period. But we, get, we, we were willing to give all of our students credit for their time served as far as in our uh, disciplinary settings during that time because we felt like we would be double punishing or keeping them out of, <coughs> when we come back to school, keeping them out of uh, instruction, much needed instruction because we realized that remote learning is not the same as being in school. And so uh, the JJEP ran uh, a program and they asked us if we would we uh, would accept that, and we did, and we indicated we would accept that if they're learning for that time. Any questions from the board? Do I have a motion? Yes. I'll move to approve the 2021 Memorandum of Understanding Juvenile Justice Alternate Education Program between MISD and Montgomery County Juvenile Board. Second. All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion passes. And going on to the next action item, consider the approval of the 2020-21 Student Code of Conduct. Uh, and, uh, every year we bring the Student Code of Conduct for you to adopt. Uh, the hand is in, it's part of our handbook, but the handbook is an information item that's later on the agenda. Uh, this is an adopted part that you guys adopt because it is uh, the rule of law for the school district. There are no changes in here because it's not a legislative session. And so we use the TASB model uh, that comes out. And on off years, they, they make changes when the legislature makes changes to the law and to the rules of uh, the Texas Education Code. But since it's an off year and the legislature did not meet, there are no updates to it at all, except for the dates and uh, things like that. So unless you have a specific question, everything is exactly as it was the prior year. And that's according to the TASB model as well. Any questions from the board? I have one, Mr. Dawson. Yeah, uh, Mr. McFadden. Last year was a was a lot of fun. Was there anything that we learned last year, or anything in our student code of conduct that should be updated? Do we need to knock the dust off of anything? Uh, you know, I went through each section as required. And I, you know, everything's in there. It's explicitly written what our, our rules are. I think it's more of a communication process and I think a training process. And we will go through, uh, every year we sit down at the beginning of school and we go through our handbook and we go through our code of conduct with every assistant principal and every principal. And we reiterate, and I think what we learned from the prior year is a lot of times what we highlight in that training in the, the fall of the coming year. So we try to learn from our mistakes and we try to learn from our experiences if they weren't mistakes. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? <clears throat> do I have a motion from the board? That's information. Then. Do we need a motion? Oh, this one, I think this one we have to um, approve it. Oh, I'm sorry. I move to approve the 2020-21 MIST Student Code of Conduct. Second. All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. 
Moving on to the approval of the disposal of out of adoption instructional materials. All right, yeah, each year, um, the last two years, we've had a new adoption uh, in uh, language arts. Uh, last year was K through eight, and this year is high school. Um, we have not cleared the old books out of our inventory yet. Um, so we do have to take it to school board approval to be able to take the out of adoption materials out of our inventory and determine what to do with them. Um, we do have some options. Um, in the past, there were some companies that allowed, uh, that took donations and they would come and pick them up and take them um, away. Uh, reaching out to surrounding districts, they just doesn't seem that they are doing that anymore, but I am going to put that out there. If anybody knows <laughs> of anybody out there that's taking donations, um, free options are always our first choice. So if somebody has a connection, I would love to hear about that. Um, otherwise, the uh, other options are to dispose of them, and you can see kind of a cost estimate um, of $375 all the way up to $800. The price difference depends on the uh, amount of um, uh, containers that they have to bring for us to dispose of them. We think we can get it in one, so we think it would be the $375. And, or we could do the recycle, which that costs a little bit more, and the company's waste management just says it costs them a lot more to be able to recycle the textbooks because of the heavy binding and things that are on the textbooks, so that's a much more costly um, decision there. Uh, so uh, the uh, action item is just to recommend that the board does allow for us to make the decision to be able to dispose of the textbooks out of adoption textbooks in some way. Have we um, have we donated these to kind of any local groups? Um, in the past, that has been done, but uh, last couple of years it has not. We actually have a warehouse that we kind of have a couple of adoptions uh, stacked up that are ready to be moved out, <laughs> and um, reached out to four of our surrounding districts of, who have done this for several years, and they say they just can't find anybody that'll take them anymore. Okay. Um, Dr. Busby, I have a former student who um, does accept donations. Oh, great. Uh, he is a principal at a primary school in Uganda, and they, um, they'd love to take donations. I sent some information to Dr. Dixon today, Perfect. but I didn't know with all the parameters of whether or not these are state property and things of that nature, so I can send you more details. Um, I would be in favor of getting you more some some more warehouse space however we need to but maybe someone can benefit from these yes that would be great that would definitely be our first choice if we can hook up with someone that we can uh, donate it to that way that's our, our first choice for sure mm -hmm. should I forward more information to you dr. Dixon yes uh, I actually in the past I talked with Amy I've always given our stuff to Rotary International because they just come pick it up it's like hands-free but they're not doing that right now because of COVID they mm. can't transport it to where they want it um, I would also like to see if we could maybe make some calls to some of the church schools or some of the private daycare or somebody that would like to have little in-house libraries um, sometimes that becomes a little bit of a burden they they're selective but uh, I think any usable disposal would be great. Mm -hmm. So as far as this motion goes, uh, of course it's our preference if we can find somebody to donate it to. But what you're asking for is really just a decision, the ability to, to decide. Correct. Any other questions from the ward? Mm -hmm. Somebody want to try a motion? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give it a shot. Uh, I'll recommend that the board approve, first off, the choice to give away the material. If not, then to dispose of it as cheap as means possible. Second. All in favor? All right. Aye. Any opposed? OK. Motion passes. On to our next agenda item, which is um, considering awarding the restoration repair work caused by vandalism at Montgomery Junior High School to Belfour Property Restoration. Um, what we're asking, uh, 
as a result of the vandalism, the price tag and estimate is now up to $1.2 million. Um, we do have a deductible of 10000 Balfour did the immediate restoration because we're in a risk pool. Um, what we're basically asking you to do is to waive the bid a requirement of anything over fifty thousand dollars is required to go out to competitive building bidding. They have already done the tear out. They haven't started the restoration yet, and um, the negotiations were between the TASB risk manager and Balfour. So what we're basically asking you is to waive the method to use to have this corrective building done because we're not using one of the legal procurement methods. <clears throat> but and I, we attach the policy that allows for the emergency damage or destruction. So just a, a couple of questions. Uh, that was a little bit of a mic drop moment there. <laughs> uh, so you're saying 1.2 million is it's, what they're thinking it's, it's going to cost? It is. That will be the contract. And is that, how does, how does our insurance work? We pay the deductible. Um, we, of course, will try to recover restitution through the legal proceedings. Um, and you said our deductible was? Is 10,000. Oh. 10,000. Okay. And um, we will try to recover that. Um, it, I think that could be reasonably expected. It might be over a lengthy period of time. But in the... Um, prosecutorial process, we will ask for that consideration. Did they, um, did, has Bill Ford given an estimate on how long it will take uh, if yeah, they were to start? Yes. The goal is to, Chris, help me, August 3rd, that they, if they start immediately, they guarantee that it will be completed by August 3rd. And that is the reason for this emergency waiver, or we would have tried to bid it out. We, the bid, well, number one, to bid it out would have been extremely extraneous because we would have had to hire somebody to do bid specs. Using Balfour, since they did the tear out, they already know what the restoration requirements would be. So they don't really have to write the specs. And so we're waiving the specs, and then, they're, then we're waiving the bids. Is there, um, does our insurance company have any um, say so in this? Because it, does, it costs us 10000 no matter what we do, right. but are they going to hedge on paying it if we didn't uh, do the bid process? No, I don't think they're, in fact, they're encouraging us to allow them to just be the intervener here. Now, they have already notified me that they're going to go for subrogation. That means to try to recover their money from the students. I already have been put on notice for that. Wow. Well, will our insurance rates go up? What a mess. We're in a risk pool. So if our insurance rate goes up, uh, you, we would not be able to pinpoint that as a okay. result of our right. incident. Yeah. The rates go up as, as the risk pool or the total damages of all the clients in our risk pool. So. Basically, we are probably going to make the risk pool go up. <laughs> but <laughs> to all the other districts out there, you're welcome. Um, I understand from what you've provided us, Dr. Dixon, Education Code 44031 lets us do this because we want to get it done before school starts, Correct. right? So we're up against the time crunch. Correct. Okay. Um, that answer, that no, that takes my second question out of the. If we had the luxury of more time, we might be asking for special consideration, but I think we would still have to go through the two-week bid process. I don't think we would probably get a lower bid because Balfour is so intimately involved with what is needed. So they would probably be the best acceptable bid regardless. So they're going to put it back to, back to new, right? As good as new. Two floors of massive water damage, ceilings, halls, all the flooring, all the way down the halls, all the desks, all the materials. We had um, evacuated the building 
kind of rapidly, and so a lot of teachers had personal belongings. Um, it's, water is as bad as fire when it comes to that. <clears throat> okay. Um, did any other board members have any questions about this? I, I guess I'm trying to understand if there's any real downside to us for adopting it. No, I don't think there, unless you really thought that there could possibly be a lower bid, but that doesn't even impact us. After the first 10000 it's not ours. Yeah. So, um, you know, other, the secondary impact of premiums and things like that, but there they are. And it's kind of nice because of the the risk pool people being the interveners. They're doing the negotiations. They're doing they're okay. doing all this. Of course, Bobby's very involved in that. He's not going to let them give us a, a low ball, low job. Balfour is very, very reputable for restoration. Any other questions from the board? Okay, do I have a motion? I'll do it. I recommend the approval of using methods other than those required by Education Code 44.031 as allowed by CH Legal Policy to award repair work at Montgomery Junior High School. Very good. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. Okay, um, now to the fun one. Considering the approval of budget amendment number one for 2019-20. It's actually pretty easy. Okay. Um, just to explain the reason for the update, the numbers in the budget amendment have not changed. The only change was a labeling um, correction um, to uh, make sure that the debt service function 71. Uh, there was a mislabel on the previous copy. Um, and so this is not increasing uh, money to the budget uh, as far as the, the general fund goes. This is moving money from one function to another to make sure that our expenditure levels are covered in the appropriate function. Okay? Um, there is an increase in the debt service um, fund um, just to cover exp expenditures that have already been Make uh, for bond payments. Um, and so this is typical um, throughout the year. Um, you see a movement from one function to another. Uh, like I said, this is not an increase uh, to the budget. It's just putting money in the appropriate functions uh, before we get to year end, um, and mainly for audit purposes. And this is just for this is for 2019-20, right? So this is this is not talking about next year at all. So this this is strictly for 1920. Okay. Any board members have any questions about that? Really, just moving it around. I, I would like to note that if you look at the beginning budget, the revenue was anticipated at 72 and the expenditures at 77. It looks like now at the ending budget with the adjustments, now we're at a 1.7 difference between revenue and expenditure from beginning budget. So we found money? We received more money. And if you look at the top, you'll see it was in local tax collections. That's always the tough one. That's the moving target. So this is this is budget, not actual, though, right? Right. Yes. Okay. Correct. Yeah. This I did not adjust the expenditures down, so this is strictly yes, sir. budget. So yeah, when you get the man. actual audit report, you should see those expenditures. Mm -hmm. yes, okay. Sir. Okay, I didn't catch that. So just to make sure that I understand, the revenues were adjusted yes. um, because those are actuals, essentially. We have actually already received that money. Right. And then the expenditures, we haven't reduced that, but we expect that those will be reduced. Okay. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Okay. Uh, do I have any motion? 
Uh, I'll make a motion. Um, I move that the administration, oh, I'm sorry, that we amend the uh, 1920 school budget as presented in the budget amendment number one. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. <clears throat> Going on to our informational items. Um, first one on the list here is the 2021 student parent handbooks. We bring this to you every summer. Uh, this year was a little different. We had to use it, uh, Zoom to discuss changes we wanted to make to the handbook. But most of these changes are not driven locally. Most of these changes are driven by the TASB model uh, student handbook that we model our handbook after. Uh, they're, they're in red. If you, had, uh, if you got a chance to review them, you saw most of them are on mental health. Uh, there was a big push in the last legislative session, and so we have updated our language to include our threat assessment teams that we have on each campus that if a student uh, makes a statement that's either threatening to himself or threatening to the environment, we have steps that are taken to notify parents of, of what assessments are being used, crisis uh, assessments, and we have assessments that we run through with our team if any of those things happen. But, so some of it was notification of parents of what happens if, if we do an assessment on their kid because of something they said or did. Uh, they said, I'm going to kill myself uh, or something like that. We, we go through a process of whether we want to refer that to an outside agency. But of course, we know about the parent of what, what our results are uh, that occurred. And so that's, and that's the major change in here. We also list all of our policies that have to do with health and uh, health and safety are listed in a section. Uh, and they're all the board policies, so it's easy for parents to figure out which one of the policies they need to look at because the board policy can be confusing. If you, I mean, we, we use it all the time, and so it seems easy, but when you refer someone, usually it's just easier to get a copy of it for them and hand it to them. Uh, but uh, it is online, it is on a, in a place where they can find it online, and so we've listed the, the actual code names for a lot of them, and they can just plug those in and get copies of them on their own. Uh, parent and family engagement. I thought it was interesting. Uh, on that one, they uh, they want they are encouraging people to come to board meetings, and we list our board uh, meeting times and dates in here as part of the parent engagement uh, and communication. So lots of stuff like that. Title IX, big uh, update to Title IX in our non-discrimination statement about who's who's responsible and, and what kind of things fall under that and what processes follow if you feel like you have a claim under that. So those are all legislatively uh, brought on changes, but sometimes it takes a couple of years for TASB to catch up. It takes the second year. Code of Conduct's always done the first year, but they they update the handbook every year because there's things that arise or they have more time to, to update it. And some of it's just changing stuff around. Diabetes uh, management was uh, in a list, a long list, and now it's pulled out and given a subsection on its own for easier identification to parents. Uh, just kind of ease of use. The handbooks have uh, improved every year, just like you improve anything every year. A new car got some improvements over the last model. So some of that's just kind of uh, like that. If you have a question about a specific change, I'll try to answer it. They put a lot in on uh, labor trafficking too, and signs to look at for, you know, parents to look for for labor trafficking under the uh, maltreatment of students. So there's lots of information in here uh, for parents. Do we, this is, is this our homegrown parent, it, student parent handbook? It or is, is it? It's based on the model student code of conduct that's put out by TASB, but we insert a lot of additional information as well. So got our own local policy, but it makes sure that we're legally updated and legally uh, communicating everything we're supposed to communicate to parents in a, in a handbook. And again, it's an information item because it can be updated at any time uh, that we feel like as long as we uh, notify parents of the changes that we make to the handbook. I just wonder, um, you know, if we're, if we're thinking that there could be a remote learning kind of environment later, is there anything that should be added in for that? Well, it could be. We're, we're, we're waiting on the uh, governor and uh, the commissioner.
Commissioner of Education on supposedly on Thursday that they're going to give us more guidelines on what exactly we can expect. But you know, that's only as good as the time, you know, because something could happen on Friday that they didn't talk about on Thursday, and everything could change. So it's a very uh, uncomfortable time to be in as far as trying to plan for the unknown. And so we're looking for some guidance from the state. And there hasn't been a lot of guidance yet. Any other questions from the board? But those could easily be added to this and, and republished. It's an in-house document that we put together, but we use the code for that, or the model for that. Thank you. OK, going on to the, the second item on here, kind of a segue, um, would be discussing the contingency planning for the school schedules. Yes, I had hoped I would be able to give a lot more today. Everybody has anticipated a 3 o'clock conference today with the Commissioner of Education that would outline the restrictions. It, it, they weren't given to us. Um, and they're hoping Thursday, but next Tuesday is what really it's going to be. So, But I would like to tell you what I have found out. Um, the Montgomery County Schools... Uh, the superintendents in the school districts have elected to maintain a traditional calendar. And so because of that, and our parents are vacillate between different communities and areas, I think we need to stay consistent with that so there won't be conflicts with parents being off and children being in school. So at this time, we're not going to change our calendar. There were several options to go year-round start earlier and do intercessions. At this time, we're not going to elect to do any of those. Um, the, the question that we don't know, number one, two primary things on the restrictions. Well, three probably, but we did get the answer on one day. On the PPP, PPEs, the personal protection equipment, um, the state is not going to require the children to have. Now, we're still going to have our sanitation and that type of stuff in place per the HHSC, the health side of it. You need to understand that I've had a lot of people ask me questions like, what is my decision going to be? We have so many regulatory agencies right now that are telling us what we will do. When this even happened, if you recall, we had spring break and then we chose not to come back the week after, but then after that, it kind of was taken out of our hands. The governor and the commissioner, then they closed the schools. Um, right now, we, we are going to offer our traditional program. I am going to ask the board tonight if um, it would be okay for me to put out a parent survey and to see what the parent, ought, do you plan to send your child back face to face? One of our biggest obstacles is transportation. We have 74 passenger buses, and the current restriction is we can only put 15 kids on a bus. So unless the parents bring their children, it is going to be impossible for us to transport them. So when we get some clarification, um, up until last week, or maybe a little before, there was a restriction of 10 students, including the teacher. For summer school, that has been lifted. So because that, that kind of gives us a hint that there's going to be some flexibility in that. So if we can have the students, then it'll be up to us after we get those lifted to then arrange the classrooms to honor the distancing, to, to, to train our children, you know, in the hygiene and precautions for something like this. But um, Dr. Null at Conroe put out a survey last night to 60,000 students. He received 18,000 responses in one day, and 75% of the parents are going to send their, their children back to school face to face. Now, that doesn't mean the other 25 are not. It, I think it's more of an undecided, probably, or how they will do that. If we do have parents that do not want to send their children back, we must provide services. Regular ed and special ed and all the other bilingual needs, we must provide these children services. 
the thing that I want y'all and to spread the word, it's not going to look like last spring. <laughs> it's going to be school. And the, the, we, a child must attend school 420 minutes a day. So if your child chooses virtual learning, they're going to be in front of a computer, in front of a teacher, but remotely. So for them to be in attendance, it's not going to be pick up a learning packet or do this and turn it in and get it graded. We're going to have to follow the guidelines. So the unknowns pop up. What if a student wants to be at home but wants to play football? What if they're in the marching band? What if they want to be in the one-act play? So we're, you must be in school, in maybe a virtual classroom or a face-to-face, -face, four hours a day to participate in any UIL or extracurricular. So there's going to be some hard decisions by parents and students that because of their individual circumstances. They may not want to physically be in an instructional program, but they may want these other options. So when we have enough information, um, we, we probably will have some type of virtual. Um, I'm not going to say we're going to encourage or discourage it, but we want your children back. And I, in the course of looking at this and reviewing these issues, our state representative also is very supportive of our children back in school with a traditional calendar. Um, the most recent um, Center of Disease Control, um, statistically of 69,000 deaths, only 12 have been of children under 14 and of then fatally among children under 18 without underlying conditions, only one. So I, I think the conclusion of this doctor that said that, yes, one child's life is not worth it, but there are, science does tell us that risk from COVID are too minimal to sacrifice the educational, social, emotional, and well-being of our children in school. And so we would like, we will encourage children to come back to school. And what are we going to do if we have another outbreak? Uh, my crystal ball broke a long time ago. So I don't know, um, and I don't even know how much of that decision making will be in our hands. I think a lot of it will be now the state leadership. We were all caught off guard. No, we, none of us knew what to do. And so our little learning packets and the things, we did such an ab admirable job on what we could do in such a short period of time, not even understanding what was happening. Um, we'll be more prepared, and it'll be school. I think that answers a lot of our questions, or at least we know that uh, as much as you can answer at this right. point. That nullified most of my questions, Dr. Dixon, because, uh, you know, we, we just don't know yet. We don't, you don't know from the state. And I guess more so than a question, I want to put a point out there to try to help you. And I know we have a lot of administrators in, in the audience and on the side here. Um, it, what we did last spring was I've, I just never I've never seen anything like that. Our, our team really swung into action, like so many people across the dis, across the state. And um, I just want to say thank you to them. And I also want to say one of the things that I really appreciated about it in my experience it wasn't it wasn't fun. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I want to do it again, but um, I still felt like there was a little bit of connection. And so whatever we can do to keep school in school, keep school feeling like it's school, rather than like a, you know, a hospital ward or something like that, I, I'm behind it. I do have one favor to ask of Dr. Busby, if it's possible, if we could investigate. One thing I did hear pretty consistently from the community was the need for like a single 
provider, a single LMS or a single sign-on even, something to that effect. So if we can at least look into that, if that's part of our contingency plan. Yeah, absolutely. And we did do a, a survey with our teachers at the end and got some feedback from them. And not only our parents, but our teachers as well want a unified way to get the communication out. Um, so we are working on that. And there's some different um, avenues that we have explored and are looking at implementing. So I think we are already um, off to a good plan B on that. <laughs> so one kind of follow up on the bus discussion. Is there any kind of schedule that sane and logical minds are actually going to discuss that? Because what you gave out there was not a reasonable concept. We were in the conversation today with the commissioner. That was one of the write-in questions, and there was no response. I guess because he did state there would be flexibility in class size, I think that they're going to have to assume flexibility in the other environments. What it will be, I don't know. But it's almost, I would probably just reserve all of our buses for, for special ed transportation. I don't even know how we could do, uh, you know, we couldn't, five or six runs is time to take them home, you know, and get them to school. So we would probably reserve as many as possible for our special pops. And um, and I just really believe, I'm so encouraged on the survey that Amy and I have been working, there is a question about if you want your child to come face to school face to face, would you be able to provide transportation? I think when we can get some of that data back in, I mean, if 50% of them could bring the kids, um, if they could do, I, I just think that, I think the parents are going to rise up and, and carpool and and get the kids there. I, I just think they're going to do it. They're going to, kids are going to walk to school that have never walked to school. Maybe I don't know. I yeah. just I, I think it's going to happen because as much as I want them back, I think the parents want them back. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I remember this is Dr. Dixon, do you have um, any? Uh, estimation uh, with you and Dr. Busby when this survey might be going out? We probably have the shell of it. I didn't want to put anything out without the board knowing first, and I think we can get it out this week. And uh, with such an overwhelming quick response that Conroe had, I think we'll be able to get some quick data. Oh, I think people are waiting for it. <laughs> They're waiting. Okay. Okay. There, it's coming then. Yeah. Um, when do you think that I know we're, we're still waiting for the state and all that, but as far as timelines on when we need to know about when we have to make decisions. I think no later than August 1st, because that's when we would be doing bus routes where we're registering kids, kindergarten roundup, where um, now we do have choice slips. We've got all the kids. We're assuming they're coming back. Those, those high school kids did their choice slips. We've got them plugged into the classes and everything. Now, if that teacher happens to be in a room with, if we have one section of English 1, in which that'll be a virtual section, that teacher is in there. And remember, this isn't going to be at their leisure anymore. They're going to have to log in at school time, and we're going to have school. Um, it'll just be a parallel program within the school day. and But I don't think we have any luxury past about August 1st. We'll have our staffing done. We just will need to know how we're going to roll them in and roll them out. Um, I think things like cafeteria will be all finished. You know, our, our the only difference is going to be that one component of instructional delivery that's remote. And I think we can whip into that now that we've had a test drive in the spring. I think we can get that done pretty quickly. We just need to know who we're going to be serving. Are we going to have 38 first graders? Uh, you know, we're going to have to create these virtual classrooms. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dixon, to Mrs. Sparza's comment earlier about special ed, how does the virtual 
uh, you got to be here at this time. How does that look for special ed? That is really tough. And she, she actually identified it's the auxiliary services. Our special ed teachers can, can do a lot of it. But again, I'm hoping you let us have them so that we can. Now, I know that some of them become our medically fragile population also. So if you're fearful of your child because of COVID, because of other medical things, we would completely understand. But that also gives us the challenges. Um, you brought up OT and PT and all those. You know, those were restricted from even going to nursing homes or anybody. So it wasn't that we didn't want to give the services. We were prohibited. Those people were not allowed to go to private homes, private facilities, long-term care. So. As many as, as many of those we can get back, we're going to be able to give them services. I think it will be our medically fragile that we may have challenges. Are we still under those kinds of, um, like, the, the, is there any idea that we couldn't send people to do those things in the fall? Oh, I think that it, when we hear what the restrictions are, now when the governor came out with his executive orders, there's different populations that are treated differently. And the Health and Human Resources one give more guidance to the long-term care, the medically fragile, the intellectually disabled. So we've got two pathways that we have to follow in addition to to governing, we have the state and the fed, the federal. The federal IDEA actually gives us more guidance. Um, I don't think they're going to punish us if we are unable, but I think we're going to have to make extraordinary efforts. I don't think it's going to be yeah. one of just, we don't want to do that today. I knew that my question sounded like I was advocating for house calls, and I'm not exactly <laughs> well, not exactly advocating for house calls today, but I've heard some other districts I, talking about that. I think that could happen. I think the PT, you know, a physical therapist could just as easily do those services in a home if they're allowed to go into the home. And my, I so, guess, and then, you know, my, my element on that is it puts our staff at risk, too. And right. And we, we want to keep them around, you know. So. Correct. Do we, um, and that's a, a good segue into my question, which is, uh, do you have a good feeling as to whether all the staff is going to come back? We will make the extraordinary accommodations for them to return if it's in an isolated area so that they... If we have a staff person who has a situation that is prohibitive to return, then we probably could design their assignment to be one of the virtual classrooms. And so that they would actually be doing their same instruction. That makes sense. Um, if one other question I had was, uh, if they're doing remote learning, do they still count towards our attendance? Yes, that was one of the other things that was to be addressed today was the funding mechanism. If they're in attendance four hours a day, remote or face-to-face, -face, we get funding for them. So now, there's you've heard two different numbers, I know from me. You've heard the four hours and you've heard the 420 minutes. 420 minutes is the required instruction and activities that we must provide a day. To get money for a student, they must have been there four hours. And that's why some of you parents know that we like for you to take them to the dentist after 2 o'clock or something, so that we have them there for the time. If they, if we take attendance at 10 o'clock and they don't come to school till 11.30 or 12, then even though they're in school that day and they receive instruction, we don't get funded for them. So, and a lot of it, we try to stress that because it is important, you know, that, that, they, that they're there for the amount of time. But again, until, I mean, we haven't heard that there's going to be any penalties yet for the spring. I think they're going to be very lax. I think that if we can document that a student logged in, did anything, they're going to let us count the spring kids. Um, and we did submit our PEMS today, our accounting for this past year. 
I don't think there's going to be that, that laxness next year. School is school, and, and we're going to have to account for that instructional time. Any other questions from the board? Okay, well, thank you so much for that update. Uh, we also have uh, the monthly accounts paid report and the monthly financials report um, that are also available in the board books. Did the board have any questions about that? No. Okay. So at this point, um, we're going to go ahead and go into closed session as authorized by the Texas Open Meetings Act uh, to talk about um, various things that are on the agenda. And we will return after um, we have some discussions. Okay, I'm going to call us back to order out of, uh, and we're coming back into the open session from our closed session. Do I have any motions from the board? Yes, Mr. President, I'd like to make two motions. Uh, first motion is to move to direct the superintendent to proceed with land negotiations as discussed in closed session. Do I have a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I need to abstain. Okay. Thank you. Uh, second motion is to approve personnel as presented in closed session. I'll make a motion. Second. <laughs> All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Okay. And then for the, um, the budget meeting uh, that we had, <clears throat> talking about the budget for the 2021-2021 budget, um, just want to make a couple of remarks about that um, for the public that's going to be watching this. Basically, we're at this point we're we're looking at a 1.6 million dollar deficit budget. Um, we appreciate that everything that uh, Dr. Dixon and Chris Lynn have done uh, to get to get us to that point, but um, but we want it to go further. And the main reason for that is that we want to be the best paid staff in Montgomery County. <clears throat> We think that that's the most important thing um, for our district. The teachers take care of uh, our kids. The other staff, we want them to be the best paid also. And for us to get to where we want to be, that is the most important thing that we want. And so um, we know that that's going to take some time to get to, but we have directed uh, Dr. Dixon and Chris to help us get to that point. And it's going to be painful to get there, but we think that that's the most important thing for us um, at this point. And so, um, so as I, I was saying before, um, this is we believe as a board that this is something that um, that needs to be done now, and we need to take the hard steps to get us to that that position. And so, I guess in closing, um, I think that uh, we'll have a, a motion here in a minute on the budget, but um, we just want everybody to know, the staff and uh, teachers and uh, administrative staff, we want them to know that we support them and that we know, um, in our view, uh, we want the money to be in the classroom <clears throat> that we're spending in this district. And we want to be the best paid staff in Montgomery County. And so we want to get there, and we want you to do what you need to do to get us there. Yes, sir. Can I add something, Jim? Yes, sir. Um, I, I agree with everything you said. Um, I agree that we need to approve this $1.6 million deficit budget today, tonight. Uh, I think the overall budget situation after our meeting is uh, – Fixable. I don't think there's anything about it that's not fixable. And I think this board has the courage and the strength and the smarts to make the right decisions to get this budget back where it needs to be and to accomplish the things you outlined. I won't repeat them. So thank you for your leadership. And um, yeah, anybody um, else? I'll say something as well. I uh, thank you, Chris, Dr. Dixon, for 
uh, you know, shaving the dollars off of the budget deficit that you did. Uh, but the work is not done as far as myself and the rest of this board, I think, is concerned. I, I, there's, there's more to go. There's more there. And, and we need to find it. So the challenges are going to be real. They're going to be difficult. Um, but I think, uh, to echo Jim's comment, if our goal, uh, which is as it should be, is to get these teachers paid, um, then we're going to have these tough decisions. And, and you have uh, my full support in, in doing whatever it takes to get there. And just to add very similar comments there that the teacher pay is paramount because uh, from the discussion we've had where they fall in comparison to the districts around us. Uh, every month going forward, there's going to be substantial uh, investigation into cost savings at all levels. Jobs that are not directly associated with a classroom will, will be looked at in detail. I'd like to see um, the pay. Um, equal to the accountability rating. Uh, our teachers do such a great job and we want them to be rewarded. And you know, just to round out our unified front here, I would say that the deficit budget has been an albatross around our, our district's neck for, for long enough and the board is ready to move and you know, we may have to de adopt a, a short-term deficit next couple of months but under no circumstances should anyone think that a deficit at the end of the year is acceptable. I don't see that as, as a goal that we're looking at. And so I, I would encourage all the administration, all the teachers, everyone that has a role in our district to lean in and help us get there because we, we do want to be what we know we can be, the best paid district in Montgomery County. And our teachers um, and our, our administration deserve that. So um, thank you, Dr. Dixon. Thank you, Chris, and everyone else who's, who's lending a hand. And I appreciate all y'all are doing. Thank you. So do I have a motion from the board? There's no motion. Oh, there's no motion. We just announced that we'll have the public hearing on the okay. 30th Okay, okay, thank six. you. Yeah, so um, we're not going to have a motion, uh, but we are going to have a public hearing on... 30th at 6 o'clock. On the 30th, on uh, the 30th at 6 o'clock uh, to talk about the final budget. So uh, with that, that's all that we have tonight. Uh, thank you so much.